Hi, my name is Tammy Pozzaricki and I own Pleasantries Adult Day and Consulting Services in Marlboro. I'm a certified Alzheimer's disease and dementia care trainer, a certified first responder dementia trainer, and a certified dementia practitioner. And I'm here to give you a shortened video training and overview of Alzheimer's and other dementia. Um, this is to just show you a little capture of of information to hopefully educate and inform you on your job as a first responder and how you deal with someone that has Alzheimer's. So just to start off with just some statistics, Alzheimer's being the most common of the dementia diseases is actually the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. One in three seniors dies with some form of dementia. Uh, 5.4 million people in America are living with this disease and the numbers are just growing. We are getting to epidemic proportions and that's because all our baby boomers are getting of age to develop the disease. Um, Alzheimer's is non-discriminating. It affects every race and culture out there. Every country is affected by Alzheimer's. What you will learn today, though, is the importance of getting a diagnosis of what's causing dementia. Um, there are risk factors, but the greatest risk factor is actually your age. The older you get, the more prevalent the disease process can become. Every five years after the age of 65, your chances double. And once you reach 85, you have a 50-50 chance of getting the disease. If you reach 95, there's a high chance you're not going to get the disease process. Um, many, many, many genes related to Alzheimer's. There's genes that are correlated with early onset Alzheimer's, which can happen in someone's 40s, 50s, 60s. The older onset, the APOE4 gene, um, that actually is associated with the older onset Alzheimer's, which couldn't usually occur in someone who's in their 80s. Um, and then there's the familial Alzheimer's, and that wipes out 50% of the entire family, and that can happen in the onset is extremely young. Um, I've worked with a, a family who's... Um, mother was actually in my institution and she was uh, 28 and she had four children. So it was a very, very sad story. But just knowing that those are the three different uh, ways in which someone develops Alzheimer's and that there are many genes that are related with it. It is the person who, um, the African American population and Hispanic population are at a much higher risk. And the reason is it's correlating with some physical predispositions to diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And really our only means of trying to prevent ourselves from getting this disease is actually living a healthy lifestyle, meaning exercising, eating healthy diet, um, drinking in moderation, not smoking, and just using our brain and being social and living a very vibrant life. And that's really the only things we can to start to begin to do to not have Alzheimer's disease in our later years. So I want to talk a little bit about what normal aging is because Alzheimer's and dementia is not normal. People who develop the symptoms of memory loss, confusion, poor judgment, disorientation, um, the inability to, you know, function in their daily tasks, that's not normal aging. Someone with normal aging may have slower recall or slower response time, may need less distraction to learn new things. Um, they're still able to follow directions, whether written or oral. Uh, someone with dementia struggles with directions. Um, cognitive mapping, that is something our brain does to get us from point A to point B. And I ask folks a lot, you know, 
have they ever misplaced their keys? And of course, a lot of people have done that. But in a normal person, we use our cognitive mapping to actually find where we left our keys. Um, someone with dementia loses that ability of cognitive mapping. And we'll start to find things that are misplaced with a person with dementia. So the keys might be found in the refrigerator where they don't belong. Um, but just to understand that these are all a set of symptoms. Everything I'm talking about, the memory loss, the confusion, those are dementia symptoms. They are, that is not a diagnosis. So why is it important that we get a diagnosis. I've seen plenty of physicians actually diagnose the person with dementia. It's important because some of the things that happen that cause dementia are treatable. And that's the thing that is so important to know about it. The reversible causes like a brain tumor, um, untreated infections, untreated depression, medication side effects, any vitamin deficiencies, nutritional deficits. These are things that if treated, the dementia symptoms could go away. So it's important that individuals with a diagnosis of dementia do get a workup. The non-reversible dementia diseases, these are the diseases that are fatal, um, neurological, and they're the, the culprits that are causing the dementia symptoms. They're all very different, and in my longer training, I go into each disease individually, um, but the thing to understand is that Alzheimer's is the most common and affects those of all ages, um, you know, younger adults to older adults. The one thing that I try to teach first responders is to learn about, no, I, people call it behavior. I don't like to use that word because with Alzheimer's disease, I look at behavior as unwanted communication. Unwanted communication because they're trying to express their feelings, uh, their emotions, their needs, their wants, and we're not liking it. So we call it unwanted communication. But these are, this is what happens with a person with dementia because they can't express themselves. So what comes out of some of the dementia, um, a lot of these diseases that cause dementia also cause delusions and hallucinations. Um, delusions are a false belief about something. And hallucinations, it's a false sensory perception. So they are actually hearing things, seeing things that are very disturbing to them. Um, going into someone's home who's having a hallucination that there's actually a gentleman in the house who's, who's um, there to hurt them. What we find with dementia is actually that gentleman who's reported a stranger in his house was actually looking in the mirror. The mirror reflected back to him a complete stranger. So that was a, an example of a hallucination. So the behaviors or unwanted communication that come out of someone in a, with a delusion or hallucination can be aggressiveness, anxiousness, paranoid, suspicious, um, and we, we just have to understand where it's coming from. The other thing it's important for you to know is the term sundowning. Sundowning is a phenomenon that occurs late in the day with a person with dementia. Um, the sun is going down, less light, darker, um, and with the person, the individual, it is at the end of the day. They are tired and fatigued. They become more confused, more disoriented, and they are attaching themselves to their caregiver. Because at this point in their day, they're feeling unsafe and they're feeling less secure. And they look to that caregiver for the next steps in their day because they don't know what the next minute of their life is going to look like. So that's what we call sundowning and really there's no specific treatment for it other than we suggest that people 
turn up the lights to make it look more like daylight in the home. Wandering. Um, as a first responder, this is really important to know the things about wandering. Um, one important fact about wandering is that if someone becomes lost, they tend to go near water, which is um, a phenomenon that happens with folks with dementia. People are found lost by streams, by lakes, by ponds, which of course poses another whole form of danger of drowning. And we're not quite sure why, but that is a, a fact that we want to make sure that we're looking near water. We are not just looking for someone in their 80s and 90s that has wandered off and gotten lost. We could be looking for that person with Alzheimer's who's in their 50s, who looks healthy and knows what he's doing, but is completely lost. Um, they may be dressed inappropriately. Um, so trying to recognize someone that's wandering, it may be freezing cold and they've got a short sleeve shirt on and they're wandering the street. Um, and they will not ask for help. That's important to understand is that we as first responders need to actually go up to them. And I'm going to go through some strategies and how to approach someone with Alzheimer's um, if you suspect that they are lost and wandering. And there are some great things in place. Marlboro, Northboro, and Hudson now have them called um, dementia registry. As part of our efforts to create a dementia-friendly community, which is to remove the stigma and get people with dementia out of isolation and engaging in their community. And the police departments have formulated this registry to keep people on file, keep their picture, keep their information, um, so that you can easily identify someone who um, has dementia. And it's actually been working really well in the three communities. Because the idea is you don't wanna shut someone in. Um, and we want them to engage. So we are, the reality is, we're going to have people wandering and getting lost. Now wandering, there's always a goal in mind with wandering. They gotta go to work, they have to pick up the kids off the school bus. Those are the things that we have to understand that there's a reason. You may run into someone who's lost and not recall why they left their safety of their home in the first place because they can't recall the fact that they thought they had to go to work. Um, someone in the parking lot at Walmart searching for their car and they're in distress and they're upset. Um, those are the people that we wanna approach with the skills I'm gonna give you um, and help them. Because there are people in the community with dementia still driving. The thing that you need to understand about the Alzheimer's disease process is that the brain is shrinking, the, the, the nerve cells are being killed off, their functioning is being um, slowed down every day, but one thing stays intact and that's their ability to feel. Their ability to feel emotion just like you and I, um, happy, mad, uh, sad, frustrated, all the feelings we feel, they feel, and they become experts at picking your body language. They know how you're feeling, and that poses a problem if you're upset, which can backfire and create the person with dementia to become upset. So it's just understanding the fact that the feelings are the best way to get um, in good communication with that person. These are the dominant feelings of a person with Alzheimer's all day long. This is how they feel. Very negative. They lose their sense of purpose. They don't feel useful anymore. They can't hold a job. They have trouble holding a household, um, paying bills, doing tasks that they would normally do every day, and now have lost the ability to do that. 
So what we're trying to do with this whole dementia friendly movement is to start to create good feelings and a good response from the community in able, in, which enables them to engage in purposeful activities. Um, communication changes. Communication changes happen with a dementia disease process. It might be word difficulty, word finding difficulty. Um, they may say one thing and mean another. Um, social graces may go. In other words, they may say things, do things that are just what we all tend to think is socially inappropriate. Um, they have sensory changes, so hearing loss, visual changes, and they, the interesting thing is that they have these moments of lucidity though, where they'll make complete sense and you say to yourself, where did the disease go? Because there are times when they make comments and they have memories and things come up where they may, you, you feel like, wow, they don't have dementia anymore. But they will have those moments and that's what I tell my caregivers to really capture those moments. Um, because this is really a disease that is moment to moment, not day to day. So let's get into some strategies. First strategy, when you're approaching a person with Alzheimer's or dementia, you want to smile. Smile is the your way of opening the door and opening the window to your communication with that person. You want to approach them at eye level and from the front. You want to introduce yourself. You want to speak clearly and not rush what you're saying. Um, if you're going to ask them a question, ask a simple question and then wait for an answer. It can take a person with Alzheimer's actually up to 90 seconds to answer your question. And they probably have the capability of doing that, but unfortunately, in our language, if we ask a question and we don't get a response, our tendency is to ask it again, ask it a different way, or ask a different question. And unfortunately, that throws them off. So it takes a lot of patience not rushing, being flexible um, in order to engage them in conversation. Uh, folks that I train, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. We need to listen, listen to what they're trying to tell us. Um, and that's a way we're going to be able to meet their needs and their wants. Showing patience and support limiting distractions, um, avoiding criticism, arguing, and saying no. Okay, those are the three things you should always remember not to do because you don't want to challenge what we call their reality. They're living in their own reality, so whatever they believe to be true, that's what's true. We um, use a term called fiblet, which is a therapeutic non-truth. We don't call it a lie on purpose because lies are negative. A fiblet is something we use to take someone out of their stress and anxiety about the situation. Um, I used many, many examples. But one in particular that strikes me is a gentleman who used to come to my day program where every afternoon he would ask for his mother. Uh, when is my mother coming to get me? Now, my first reaction is to say, what are you talking about? Your mother died 30 years ago and you're 85 and your mother's not around. And what that causes is immediate distress and re-grief for this gentleman. He is being told for the first time that his mother is deceased. A better way to handle that is when he asks where his mother is, Arthur, your mom is at the beauty parlor. and When she gets her hair done, she's gonna come and get you. So while we're waiting, would you help me with this basket of towels to fold? And he feels relief, reassured. 
He was heard. So we talk about validation, empathy, and redirection. And redirection, we're taking that person, that person's focus onto something that's not stressful to them. And in order to redirect them, we have to validate their feelings, empathize with them, and then move them in the right direction. More strategies, creating a calm environment and making sure that the distractions of loud noises, sirens and, and um, you know, TVs blaring and pagers going off. And they have a very limited um, way of hearing what we're trying to say to them. And if we're not clear and in front of them and less distraction, it's not going to be successful. Being... Um, Offering someone with Alzheimer's praise or a compliment, um, they love that. And where they have all those bad feelings all the time, certainly we can offer that to them. We want to decrease their level of danger. And as a first responder, we're going to be acting immediate. And I, I really think as first responders, if we take just a second to... Um, you know, to really think about how we're gonna approach and handle someone with Alzheimer's. We really um, diffuse any power struggles with them and to really think about how our actions are gonna affect the whole situation when dealing with someone with dementia. But as first responders, you have to decrease the level of danger immediately. But if we can do that, in a way that we approach and calm them down and able to redirect them versus using any sort of force or being commanding. Those are the things we want to avoid if at all possible. These are the benefits to good communication. We're validating their feelings, we're making them feel good, enhancing their self-esteem, um, and preventing those catastrophic reactions, which what is a catastrophic reaction? It's basically out of proportion to what's really happening. So if we listen and we develop a good rapport with them, hopefully we can redirect them before they get to the point of feeling that catastrophic reaction. Um, so using these approaches, are going to help us in having a successful um, communication with that person and making them feel safe. And these are the barriers, the commanding, the, the speaking too quickly and rushing them, arguing with them, um, and offering long explanations for things with complicated questions. So just understanding, sometimes it's easier to learn what not to do than what to do. So you want to just kind of take this into consideration for both what's good and bad about communication skills. But this is a cool slide on the top 10 tips um, of how to actually talk and communicate with someone with Alzheimer's. Um, I, I want to thank you. It has been a pleasure to talk with you today about Alzheimer's. Um, as it relates to first responder, my hope is that someday I will be able to do this in person with you and give you a much longer presentation. Um, but thank you for listening today.